Understanding Userland. Userland is a term used to describe when the processor is in a limited, privileged state. Userland is what operating system processes run in. Kernel land is the state that the kernel runs in. It is a high privileged state. Let's now explain further what the userland term actually means. So the userland term describes a limited processor state. So if you remember before I briefly went over the protection ring, rings of the processor, you have ring 0, ring 1, ring 2 and ring 3. Well, userland refers to ring 3. Whilst the processor is in this state, it is unable to execute privileged instructions, such as instructions that change the global descriptor table or the paging tables. Direct hardware access using in and out instructions is also restricted. Userland is safe because if something goes wrong, the kernel is able to intervene. For example, if I do something I'm not supposed to, it generates a protection fault and the protection fault interrupt handler is invoked for that. And then we, the kernel, are expected to handle that exception. And how will we handle something like this? We would terminate the offending process. So I just want to make clear that userland is not a special place where processes run. It's simply a term that we use to describe the processor when it's in a privileged, limited state. Let's now explain the kernel land term. Kernel land is when the processor is in its maximum privileged state, ring zero. Whilst in kernel land, any area in memory can be changed. Any CPU instruction can be executed. There's also a high risk of damage to the system if things were to go wrong. Kernel land is when the processor is in a privileged protection ring, such as ring zero or ring one or ring two. However, when we talk about kernel land, we are generally referring to ring zero. Let's now explain some of the user land restrictions. Access to certain locations in memory can be restricted for user land processes. We can do this using paging. There's a supervisor bit in, in the page tables that allow us to restrict access to the memory unless they are in kernel land or essentially a supervisor mode. Which, which is the same thing as kernel land. So we can set the supervisor bit in any page using paging, and then that 4096 byte page will only be accessible whilst in kernel land. So access to certain CPU instructions are restricted from user land. As I said, we can't talk to hardware directly with in and out instructions. We can't change the page tables and so on. So using paging, the kernel can ensure all processes cannot access each other's memory. And we do this by ensuring that every process has its own page tables and page directory. And then when we switch process, we simply switch the page directory that the processor has loaded. So you know when we first loaded the page directory and then enabled paging? Well, we can essentially flip between the page directories as we swap processes. So if we switch to process B or process C, we can switch the processor to point to their page directory instead. And then that gives the illusion that everyone has their own memory space. Okay, because the physical memory is not mapped to the virtual memory. Essentially, address COX00 could be mapped to address COX1000, for example. They don't have to be linear. And we can take advantage of this paging model to ensure that all processes cannot see each other's memory at all. And the best part about this, processes can even share the same memory addresses because there's a guarantee they won't override each other because we switch the page directory whenever we switch to the process. So 0x1000 virtual address might point to 0x2000 physical address for process A, but 0x1000 virtual address might point to 0x5000 a physical address for process B, if that makes sense. So attempting to run privileged instructions whilst in user land, i.e. ring 3, will cause a protection fault. The protection fault exception interrupt handler will then be responsible for solving the problem. Uh, and in most cases, you would terminate the offending program at this stage because the user program shouldn't be trying to run in privileged instructions.
So this means that either, either an error has happened in the user program or it's trying to do something malicious. So it absolutely should be terminated in, in most cases. So getting to user land can be quite complicated. It's when you think about it, it's quite simple. But when you first implement this, it can be complicated. So I'm going to briefly go through the steps in this presentation before we start writing any code. Okay, so if you remember at the very start of the protective mode section, we set up kernel segments. So kernel code segment and kernel data segment, which explained the mapping of the whole memory and the permissions that it had. If you remember, we did that. Well, userland has its own user code and data segments, much like we have kernel code and kernel data segments. So we need to set those up. That's the first thing we need to do. The next step is to set up a task switch segment. More will be explained on that later. The final step is to pretend we are returning from an interrupt and we push appropriate flags and data to the stack before we execute an IRET instruction. This will force the processor to change its privileged state. So step one, setting up the user segment registers. So firstly, we need to change the implementation of how we are loading our kernel segment and data segment. Uh, currently it's done in the bootloader. Ideally we want something like this where we can specify this in C and we'll pass it through some sort of function and it would look at these arguments and it would populate the, the real structure here which has uh, the bits all over the place like you see in the, uh, in the uh, bootloader structure for the kernel code and kernel data segments we made. So essentially we just want to clean this up a bit so that we can pass uh, values without having to worry about bitwise logic and we'll have a function that basically reads this structure and converts it to ones compatible with the processor. So that's the first thing we want to do and you'll notice there's a user code segment and a user data segment here as well. So we'll be implementing something like this. You also see the TSS segment. We will now explain what that is. So TSS stands for task switch segment and the responsibility of the task switch segment structure is to hold information such as the kernel stack pointer and the kernel stack segment. In the event there's an interrupt in user land, what will happen is the task switch segment will be populated with some information and it will also copy the kernel stack address that we've stored in the task switch segment and the kernel stack uh, segment descriptor and it will repopulate the registers in the CPU. Uh, preparing to run our kernel interrupt. The processor will then push certain things to the stack to allow it to understand how it can get back to user land and continue executing our user program when we return from the interrupt routine. Okay, so that's what you need to understand so far about the task switch segment. So the task switch segment structure looks a little like this in C. Uh, so we can see we have our stack pointer and our stack segment. These are the only uh, variables that we need to worry about in this task switch segment structure. So the final thing to do to get to user land is we need to pretend we are returning from an interrupt. Okay, so you know I just explained how when you're in user land and there's an interrupt it pushes certain things to the stack so that when the kernel issues an IRET, it will run back into user land and continue where it left off in the user program. Well, this implementation doesn't require an interrupt to happen to work. So what we can do is we can push to the st stack and then issue an IRET instruction ourselves, even though we're not in an interrupt team. And this will trick the processor into going into an unprivileged state, user land. So how we do that is we set our segment registers to the user data segment. Uh, so it's likely to be 0x23 and we'll set the, the data segment, extra segment, FS and GS registers. But we will not change the stack segment because we still need to use the stack at this point. So uh, it would be dangerous to change the stack segment, right? So what we now do is we save our stack pointer into the EAX register because we're about to modify the stack. So now we push the user data segment to the stack, i.e. 0x23, and we push our stack pointer we saved in EAX earlier, okay? And now we push the current flags to the stack, but not before we bitwise or the bit that re-enables interrupts. So this is important because at this point in time, interrupts are disabled, right? Uh, 
and then when we issue the IRET, we want interrupts to be automatically re-enabled. But we can't re-enable interrupts uh, manually because there's a chance an interrupt could happen once whilst we've already changed these segment registers. So it's dangerous. So by setting the bit and the flags before we push the flags back to the stack, we ensure that the re-enabling of interrupts only happens when we issue an IRET instruction. The processor will then look at the flags and re-enable the interrupts for us. So we're not issuing an IRET just yet. We now need to push the user code segment, which should be 0x1b. And then finally, we push the address of the function we want to run in userland. So if we're resuming a task that's already running, this will be the IP, uh, basically the address that was running before we saved it, the, the user tasks registers. But more will be explained on that later. So the last step is to call an IRET instruction which will force the processor into a user land unprivileged state okay so they, these are the function prototypes and structures for entering user land so we can see we have our register structure here okay and we have a restore general purpose registers function which will take in a pointer to this structure here this register structure and it will basically set all the registers in the processor to the uh, equivalent variable ones that you pass in here Okay, uh, apart from the IP, we can't change that directly. Uh, so here we have user mode enter. This is also a prototype. This will be the function we use to enter user land. It expects a register structure pointer provided to it, and it will essentially change all the general purpose registers to the ones in the, in the register structure you provided here, and it will cause the processor to begin executing the address stored in the IP variable by here okay so let's now look at the code for that so this is our user mode enter function you can see that we get the structure pointer that was passed to us which is at this address here and we store that pointer in ebx okay we now push the stack selector to the stack which can be seen here the ss uh, variable and we now push the stack pointer to the stack which can be seen here esp Okay, and then we push the flags. We pop the flags back off into EAX. And then we all the interrupt bit to those flags and we push the flags back to the stack. Because remember, we need the interrupt bit because when we do an IREP, we want interrupts to be re-enabled again. Now we push the code segment. We push the IP we want to execute. We then set up the segment registers and we pass the pointer provided to us this pointer here, struct registers, we pass that to the stack re ready for when we call restore general purpose registers. So that'll pass that to that function. That's what I'm trying to say. And then we restore the stack pointer by four bytes because we don't want to call a pop here because we might corrupt some registers, right? Now we IRET and if you did that correctly, you should now be running in user land at the IP that you specified here. This is the restore general purpose registers function. So you can see we just grab ESI from the structure and we set the real register ESI. We grab EBP and we set the real register EBP and so on until all the general purpose registers have been set. So getting back to user land when in a kernel interrupt is very easy. We just call an IRET because all that stuff we pushed to the stack whilst we were entering user land, that's done automatically by the processor. When code in, in user land causes some sort of interrupt to happen, the interrupt routine will be called, but not before the processor does exactly what we just did to get into user land in the first place. So then getting back is very easy. You just do an IRET at the end of your kernel routine, and it will basically execute the user program again. Uh, just after the, the init instruction they used to get to kernel land in the first place. So in a multitasking system, user land registers will need to be salvaged when entering kernel land. So essentially you can take advantage of the timer interrupt uh, and uh, we can grab the current task, we can save all of its registers in memory somewhere and then switch to another task, okay? And then as long as we switch all the registers back to the previous registers uh, that we in the other task that we saved, then we can flick between tasks and the, the tasks will have no idea at all. So that's how multitasking works, by the way.
So that's all for this lecture. I understand it's a mouthful. It will take a few lectures before we actually have some user code running. Uh, so just stick with it.